It's two for one check, splat, just like that. Bring in your tons of information, that's where he's at. He goes around town covering topics you like to know. But, 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 well, that's what you get when you tune in to the Two for One Jack Show. members of the National Medal of Honor Museum Foundation and Board of Directors, including Congressional Medal of Honor recipients Colonel Retired Jack Jacobs and Major William Swenson. Also in attendance today are representatives from the state of Colorado, the city and county of Denver, Colorado National Guard, Colorado Veterans Organizations, and citizens from our great state of Colorado. Thank you all for being here today as we gather to honor valor above and beyond the call of duty. The Medal of Honor, the highest award for valor in action against an enemy force, which can be bestowed upon an individual serving in the armed services of the United States. Generally presented to the recipient by the President of the United States of America in the name of Congress, got students here today. It's a little little history lesson for them. On December 9, 1861, Iowa Senator James Grimes introduced number, uh, Senate Bill number 82, a bill designed to promote the efficiency of the Navy by authorizing the production and distribution of medals of honor. On December 21st, the bill was passed authorizing 200 such medals be produced, which shall be bestowed upon such petty officers, seamen, landsmen, and marines as shall distinguish themselves by their gallantry in action and other seamen-like qualities during the present war, which was the Civil War. President Lincoln signed the bill. The Navy Medal of Honor was born. Fast forward a year just actually a couple months later, February 17, 1862, Massachusetts Senator Henry Wilson introduced a similar bill, this one to authorize the President to distribute medals to privates in the Army of the United States who shall distinguish themselves in battle. Over the following months, wording changed slightly as the bill made its way through Congress. When President Abraham Lincoln signed SJR number 82 on July 12, 1862, the Army Medal of Honor was born. It read in part, resolved by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that the President of the United States be, and he is hereby authorized to cause 2,000 Medals of Honor to be prepared with suitable emblematic devices and to direct that the same be presented in the name of Congress to such non-commissioned officers and privates as shall most distinguish themselves by their gallantry in action and other soldier-like qualities during the present insurrection. With this simple and rather obscure act, Congress created a unique award that would achieve prominence in American history like few others. The Medal of Honor over the years has become a historic symbol of the bravest of the brave and little has been done to change its actual design. The Navy Medal was the first, followed quickly by the Army version of this award. There are three different types of Medals of Honor today. The original simple star shape established in 1861, which the Navy, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard have retained. A wreath version designed in 1904 for the Army, and an altered wreath version for the Air Force designed in 1963 and adopted in 65. The Medal of Honor is the only United States military award that is worn around the neck rather than pinned to the uniform. Medal of Honor recipients also wear the medal itself around the neck of civilian attire for special occasions. One statistical note for you, 71 living recipients out of a U.S. population of over 326 million demonstrates that these Americans represent the best of what our country values most honoring valor above and beyond the call of duty. All right, let's cut to the chase while we're all in a parking lot in downtown Denver on a Tuesday afternoon. As many of you know, the National Medal of Honor Museum Foundation is considering this very site for the location of their new national museum. Ms. Catherine Lee Bates penned the poem, America the Beautiful in 1895 atop Pikes Peak as she so eloquently states in the fourth stanza of the beloved poem, O oh beautiful, for heroes proved in liberating strife, who more than self their country loved, and mercy more than life. 
we speak for all of the citizens of the great state of Colorado that our state, Colorado, would be privileged and extremely honored to have the National Medal of Honor Museum called Colorado Home. Do I get a cheer for that from you? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is our distinct honor to introduce the CEO of the National Medal of Honor Museum, Mr. Joe Daniels. Good afternoon, everybody. I just wanted to talk very, very briefly and express my gratitude for this really wonderful show of support. I have uh, spent the last 12 years of my life prior to undertaking this project as president of the 9-11 Memorial and Museum in New York City. And over the years, I've seen the power that museums have to transform the lives of our younger generations. I can say for sure that there are millions of kids that have gone to the World Trade Center, experienced that memorial in front of the 2,983 names, gone into the museum, and the first time that they went back to their cities or towns across the country and they saw a firefighter or a police officer, they saw them with a renewed level of respect and understanding what it means to be a public servant and a first responder. The reason I took this job on to create, help create the National Medal of Honor is because that opportunity is so stark in this case. When I talk to some of the recipients, including Will and Jack up here, these recipients, they, as they will tell you, they don't wear the medals for themselves, they wear it for others. They are interested in this museum, not as a tribute to themselves but they realize that their stories, the stories of the Medal of Honor, are literally origin stories that showcase the best of who we are in our relatively short 243-year history. Their stories have the, inspired to, have the power to inspire these young kids right over here and out there. So the next time that you find yourselves in a situation we've all been in, being a silent witness, for example, watching some poor kid get bullied, in that moment, because you've heard these stories of what these men did in the face of absolute stark circumstances, putting others above self, in that moment, you'll step forward and do the right thing. It is my great pleasure, I want to also thank my board of directors who came out to be a part of this evaluation. We're, we're down to the final two weeks, and every moment that we've been in Denver over these last few months, we have just been filled with warmth, and it's not lost on us that we're on the corner of Lincoln and Colfax, and as you just heard from the professor, um, obviously Abraham Lincoln started this medal. So we realize we're in a special place being next to the state capitol, looking out on the mountains. It feels special. The word American hero does get used so often, it sometimes can be abstract. That is, in fact, we, why we want to build this museum to emotionally connect to the stories of the men, the, the individuals who went above and beyond for our country. It is my great pleasure to welcome one of those American heroes, one of my newest board members, and actually not only a legend um, in the local area, but a national treasure, Colonel Jack Jacobs. Yes. Woo! I'm delighted to be here, although at my age, I'm delighted to be just about any place. You probably can't see me, can you? I'm behind this podium. I'm a very, uh, I'm a very short uh, adult, for which I'm eternally grateful. I, I don't know how you could be much taller than I am and still manage to survive combat. When I was getting ready to go into the Army, everybody said, don't go into the Army because Everybody's got to be big and strong. You, you got to be able to bench press an automobile and so on. And you're a little weaselly person and you'll never make it in combat. Until all the bullets and shrapnel start flying around, everybody tries to get to be about this big. So I'm, I'm very grateful for my parents being extremely small, which made me very small, which gave me the opportunity to survive combat. It's very hard to hit you when you, well, they hit me anyway, but it's very hard to do it when you're really that small. 
and I retired from the Army some time ago and became what passes for a civilian. And uh, being very small is, uh, as a civilian is very good too. Uh, I have a very small carbon footprint. We're trying to get low carbon. I'm very ecologically sound. I can wear kids' clothes and so on. And I'm shrinking too, by the way. One of these days, somebody's going to say, where the heck? Jacobs, he was just here yesterday, and I said, well, he was about that big, and now he's not here anymore. He's just disappeared completely. Um, many of us, all of us of my generation, grew up in the shadow of the Second World War. We were born in neighborhoods uh, in which every single household had made a contribution to the defense of the Republic. My father had served in New Guinea and the Philippines in the Second World War. In the Army, when he came home, I was eight, nine months old. He'd never seen me before. Everybody had made a contribution to the defense of the country. Today, we've decided to outsource the defense of the Republic to a very small number of brave young, and young men and women who are willing to do it. Most Americans, except probably in Denver and certainly in Colorado, do not know anybody in uniform. You're looking at somebody who believes that if you're lucky enough to live in a free country, you owe it something in the form of service. Um, and there are a lot of people who believe that alongside me. I came into the Army because I thought I owed my country something in the form of service. And I was going to do my bit, get out after three years. But I stayed, and I stayed because uh, I really loved the people and I didn't want to leave them. It's important that we remember that right now there are young people out there, right this very minute, who are defending us and our values. And they'll keep doing it for us. And we can't forget them. When I was decorated, there were almost 400 living recipients of the Medal of Honor. Today, you heard there are 71 of us alive. The first Medal of Honor get-together I attended, my table mates included Eddie Rickenbacker, the ace from the First World War. Happy Boynton, the Ba Ba Black Sheep Marine Corps aviator. There were stu still two living recipients from the Indian Wars. And in the hall, where we had our dinner, there was a living recipient, well, he couldn't otherwise be dead, but he was a living recipient, a guy named Bill Seach, who charged the Citadel of Beijing in 1900 during the Boxer Rebellion. Uh, they're all gone. And despite the award of lots of medals of honor, relatively speaking, the large majority of medals of honor have been awarded posthumously. Despite those awards since that time, I was decorated 50 years ago, we are now down to 71. And some time ago, we realized that we're a wasting asset. If we are going to leave any legacy whatsoever, it needs to be the edification of communities and particularly of succeeding generations who will understand what it takes to defend the Republic and our values. Uh, thus the uh, character development program which is in every state and schools in the country and the Medal of Honor Museum which we're working on right now. It's important that the sacrifices not of us but of those who never came home uh, are made clear to those people who might have to defend the country, who should be defending the country in the future. I'm reminded about that when Joe said, uh, we don't wear it for ourselves, we wear it for all, all those who can. Consider this. Uh, in the Second World War, there were 19 million people under, uh, under arms. And there are people fighting right now. In order to receive the Medal of Honor, people have to see what you did, have to be able to write it, it has to pass through the chain of command and the bureaucracy, and you know what bureaucracies are like and so on. So think about all those who performed valiantly in combat and nobody saw it. Think about situations in which people saw it, but they themselves were killed and nobody was left to bear witness. 
or the paperwork was written up and either accidentally or on purpose it was lost. And you realize why all of us recipients say the same thing. We don't wear it for ourselves. We wear it for all those who can. I'm reminded talking about, uh, about service of, the, of an observation of John Stuart Mill. And I'll paraphrase it when he said, when he wrote, war is, a, is an ugly thing, but it's not the ugliest of things. A man for whom nothing is more important than his own personal safety is a miserable creature who is made free and kept free by the exertions of better people than he. We all should think about that every single day. And I'll leave you with one last observation from no, none other than, than Benjamin Franklin. In the shadow of what was to become the revolution, when times were extremely difficult for the colonies and for this incipient glorious nation of ours, when he wrote, we must hang together or we will surely hang separately. Thanks for having us here. God bless you all and God bless America. Thank you very much, Colonel Jacobs. It is now our honor to introduce the incoming commander of our Colorado Army National Guard, Brigadier General Douglas Paul. I'd like to uh, once again welcome the uh, Congressional Medal of Honor Museum uh, leadership and board for uh, considering Denver uh, one of uh, a couple of areas uh, to put this amazing concept and bring it to reality. I'd also like to thank all of my fellow Coloradans for coming out in force today and showing what community means to such an important uh, event and structure. For the kids out there, and I'm looking at the folks in uniform, I don't mean to say kids, but when you're up here public speaking, don't ever follow a Medal of Honor recipient. <laughs> no good can come of it. I thought about what I was going to say today, as we all did. Um, the city of Denver put on just a tremendous um, layout of what the city can bring, what Colorado can bring, and subsequently what the region can bring uh, through our military uh, bases, through our partnerships, through the regional community. And I thought I would talk about what it means to, to have community because this concept, what this is going to be, there's, there's plenty of museums. We have beautiful museums right here in Denver. This will be in the museum district. There's museums all over our great nation, art museums, history museums. But this is such a, a unique and special museum. There's not many Medal of Honors with, uh, awardees, recipients. It is something so significant, so unique, that it really deserves such a, a special place. And it needs to be, in my opinion, in the heart of a great city, in the heart of a great state, in the heart of a great nation because what it really needs is community to make it succeed. Our state is known for several uh, awardees. Of course, we have Pueblo. We have four awardees from the city of Pueblo alone. And everybody knows that. But what they don't know are the intangibles. Now, when the Colorado Guard got called up right after 9-11, we actually mobilized out of Pueblo, Colorado. We stayed in the brand new uh, Marriott Medal of Honor uh, Hall. And so we were there for about two weeks. Every day we would go by the statues, go by the verbiage, read about it, knowing that there was about 83 of us that were gonna go over to Afghanistan in the weeks following. Uh, Drew Dix, Medal of Honor recipient, he came by, he heard we were there, and he came by and not just talked to us, not just shook everybody's hand, but sat down and had dinner with all 83 people that were getting ready to go overseas. That's community. That's something more than just a, an intangible of a statue. That's reaching out and embracing those going overseas even though you've been there yourself and done that. Most people don't know this as well, but we have a long Western history, obviously. We have the great spirit of the West out here. Uh, William Cody, better known as Buffalo Bill, Medal of Honor recipient. A lot of you folks don't know that probably. We as a state, 
we put his grave up on Lookout Mountain. It overlooks the great city of Denver. In my own hometown of Monument and Palmer Lake, small community, uh, we had William Crawford, a Medal of Honor recipient from Pueblo. He retired out there and he used to walk his dog around Palmer Lake uh, every day from what I'm told. Nobody knew he was a recipient until he got a job as a janitor at the Air Force Academy and some cadets learned his, his history, learned his story. And so they brought him to the forefront. He was so humble and honored that you know he, he didn't want to make a big uh, deal out of it. But the city of Palmer Lake, uh, we, we got together, we got businesses together. It's a small town. And we made a Medal of Honor memorial out of uh, granite and nice plaques overlooking uh, the lake where all the kids and people can walk by as they spend their, their recreation there at the nice lake. I was asked to show up to that, and I, of course I did, and I was thinking, you know, it might get 100 people, 200 people. I mean, there's only 3,000 people in the area or so. And when I got there, I, I had to literally almost have a police escort to get up to the front. The entire town, it seemed like, showed up. I mean, businesses shut down, and it was an overwhelming response to, you know, our offering, our acknowledgement of William Crawford. So we're surrounded by this history, and we want to bring more history here. This is a beautiful location. It's going to be a museum for the very finest in our nation. And as you heard the recipients discuss, it's not just a museum about an award, about an individual. It'll be a museum about honor. It'll be a museum about integrity. It'll be a museum about selfless service. And it, in fact, will be a museum about the soul of our nation. So I just want to thank everybody for showing up, showing your support, and we look forward to the decision, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, General Paul. One more guest I'd love for you to hear from. As most of you know, the Veterans of Foreign Wars Post 1 was organized by returning veterans of the Colorado State Militia following the Spanish-American War. Their first meeting was held at the Colorado State Capitol on December 1st, 1899. It is our honor to introduce the commander. He wasn't at that meeting, but he's been at many since. Commander of VFW Post 1, Commander John Keene. Here, Rick. Um, we seem to be doing a lot of these lately. We just were at a dedication for a post office here in um, in the area for Medal of, Medal of Honor recipient George Sacato and his daughter is here in the front row, Leslie. Hi, Leslie. Um, he was a member of Post One, and in our hearts, he will always remain, remain a member of Post One. Um, and I'm just honored here to speak uh, to this crowd as a representative of the veteran community. And the only reason I can do that comfortably is because um, of the community that the general was talking about. I think it's unique to the state of Colorado, and, and I definitely see it in Denver, that veterans groups here are very collaborative. Um, we might give each other a hard time as to who served in what branch and things like that, but when it comes time to doing the work, we all seem to get on the same page and work towards the same goals. Um, so much so that one of our, or two of our life members started a different not-for-profit called Colorado, Colorado Veterans Project. They now currently, um, they host the largest food drive in the state of Colorado. Um, we have, as you can see over here, maybe you haven't noticed it, we have veterans that um, are members of our post that are award-winning artists, and they have some of their artwork on display. Um, as Rick said, our our organization is the first and oldest VFW in the nation, and we take that um, as, a, as a source of pride, and we want to make sure that we lead the way uh, moving forward into the 21st century, and we satisfy the needs of, of current veterans as well, and we've found that art, um, everybody knows that art therapy is a thing, right? But what we've done is we've taken to the next level, and we give the artists an opportunity to display their art and sell their art and learn how to be self-sufficient and be business people, um, non-starving artists, as one of our members likes to say. Um, we also have, we're also very much engaged in the legislative process. 
Uh, one of our members, David Ortiz, was sitting over here. He's running for uh, state office right now. He helped guide a bill through the legislature that gives military veterans a, um, a tax break on their retirement to make Colorado more veteran friendly. So again, building that sense of community within, within the Colorado uh, veterans community and something, even though the, the numbers are small and they're dwindling, um, we are kind of everywhere. We are your neighbors. So um, when we talk about community, not only in the veterans community, but we're also out in the, in the regular community helping support things like this, um, this push for the museum. So I'm gonna get my notes out here because I think I'm gonna forget something. Oh yeah, that's, that's what it was. We want to make sure that the board knows that Colorado would be a great home. Um, I moved here from Chicago. It seems like there are very few natives around, so everybody seems to be coming to the state for one reason or another. Uh, we hope that the museum would consider that as well. Um, and also, <clears throat> the um, just the fact that there are other things that are um, hidden in the city that you might not know. Fairmount Cemetery, which is in the southeast part of Denver, um, that's where our founders, founding members are buried. But there's also a, a, a memorial there to the Nisei. So the Japanese American veterans of World War II, they have their own monument out there. And Fairmount, uh, not only is it the final resting place of uh, Joe, but it is the home to six, actual six Medal of Honor recipients. So we have a, a, a long history. Um, our tentacles run deep throughout the state. And I hope that you really consider uh, bringing the museum to our great city. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commander Keen. So why does, um, so why am I up here? Why does this knucklehead get to be up here and, and do this? Well, I was free. Part of it. Actually, I've had the great honor of doing a bunch of emceeing events down at the state capitol, but nothing's been more important to me than my what has become my life's work with the Colorado Freedom Memorial. If you just take Colfax East, eventually you'll be in the neighborhood of the memorial that lists the names of all Colorado veterans killed in action since we became a state, since the Spanish-American War. And we have been the proud home of all of Colorado's posthumous Medal of Honor recipients, those who received the medal for their service and died on the battlefield. And as I stood out there this weekend in the morning by myself, I thought, how wonderful would it be if this beautiful museum made it ways here and these Colorado Medal of Honor recipients knew that they would be joined by the home that honors not only them, but all the others. And so from all of us here in Colorado, on behalf of our governor, Jared Polis, Mayor Michael Hancock, and as we mentioned earlier, over 400,000 Colorado military service members, veterans, and their families. Uh, thank you to all of you for being here today. Thank you to the board and to the foundation for coming back to our great state and giving us one more look over. We're pretty good looking, we think, all in all. And there are no mountains in Arlington, so come on back. We'd love to welcome you here. Thank you, everybody, for being at today's ceremony. For one check, splat, just like that. Bringing you tons of information, that's where he's at. He goes around town covering topics you like to know. But, 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 well, that's what you get when you tune in to the two for one jack.